This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Aloha, and welcome to the monthly public lecture of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. It's good to see all of you here tonight. The Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, since 1990, has continued to follow our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education, as we've grown to become one of the largest nonprofit vegetarian societies in the nation. It is now time for our special guest. We're delighted to have with us tonight Joanne MacArthur. Joanne MacArthur is an award-winning photojournalist who for over 10 years and on all seven continents has been documenting both heartwarming and heart-wrenching stories about our relationships with non-human animals. Her goal is to educate and change the hearts and minds of people about how we treat animals. Her photographs are at once beautiful and shocking and serve as a call to action for all humans to widen our circle of compassion. Her documentary project, We Animals, is internationally celebrated, and over 80 animal organizations, including Sea Shepherd and the Good Jane Goodall Institute, have benefited from the use of images from this project. Many organizations have also worked with her closely on campaigns and investigations. She has won many awards, including recently the 2011 Canadian Empathy Award and Farm Sanctuary's 2010 Friends of Farm Animals Award. She's also been named one of CBC's Top 50 Champions of Change, one of 20 activists featured in the book The Next Eco Warrior, and one of Huffington Post's Top 10 Women Trying to Change the Planet. Her presentation tonight is entitled Widening Our Circle of Compassion, Please join me in welcoming Joanne MacArthur. <laughs> this is my roommate. <laughs> Thank you right. so much. This is my roommate. <laughs> My name is Joanne MacArthur. I'm from Toronto. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, little did I know 10 years ago when I started this project that there would be such an audience for it and uh, so many people who want to learn about animal rights and come with me along on the journeys that I've been on for the last 10 years. And there have been many journeys. So thanks for having me here. It's, a, it's really an honor. I'm going to introduce you to lots of animals in the next hour. You're going to meet farm animals, rescued farm animals. You're going to meet rescued Malaysian and sun bears, Asiatic bears. They live at sanctuaries in Southeast Asia. You're going to meet rescued gorillas in Cameroon. And this is my favorite part. You're going to meet a lot of really amazing people who are doing small things and big things to help animals around the world. And this is really where the hope is for me. You're also going to meet former poachers who live in Uganda who used to trap animals and now they actually work in communities to go out and de-snare the forest. So it's going to be a bit of an emotional roller coaster. I will warn you now that there, there aren't graphic images, but there are difficult images and difficult stories. So just bear with me through it and hold tight. And I promise, you know, to, if I bring you down, I'm going to bring you up again. <laughs> I'd like to dedicate this presentation to my friend Ron. You see him here in the picture. He recently passed, but he was rescued by a group called Save the Chimps. He lived in Florida at a sanctuary. This is him at the sanctuary. But I'll tell you a bit more about him at the end of the presentation. However, I do like to dedicate it to him because he's just one of the faces that I've met. And I've met hundreds of thousands, actually, of animals along the way. And he's very dear to me. So how did I start this journey? 
It wasn't really on purpose. My mom gave me some great advice. She said, figure out what you love to do and find a way to make a living doing it, which might seem really overly simple, but this is something I really needed to hear. So I did my degrees in English and geography. In the meantime, I love to travel. I love taking pictures. Loved spending time with animals. This is me with a chimpanzee I was looking after. And I'm very curious about the world and why we do th the things we do. This is in India. He's a vendor and this is where he spends 14, 16 hours a day every day. I've been to over 40 countries on all seven continents. I've met all sorts of interesting people along the way, especially this guy. I always include this slide because he's just so funny. <laughs> He, I photographed him for probably 10 minutes while he combed his hair and admired himself in the mirror. <laughs> Handsome bugger. So eventually my camera became my tool, my all-access pass to the lives of others. And this tool allowed me to glimpse and document the lives of others. This is at an elephant sanctuary in Thailand. Oh, and you're probably all wondering why I get to have this glamorous lifestyle as a photographer and pe people assume I'm independently wealthy or I have rich parents, so I'll just clarify that right now and satisfy your curiosity. I'm a commercial photographer, so I work very hard six months a year in Toronto doing events and weddings and food photography, and I use that money to fund the other work, which has become the animal rights work. I have a really great mentor named Larry Tell. He's a world famous photographer. And I was at his house and telling him about all my adventures and this and that. And he said, what's your point? And this was really a really harsh critique for me because I had taken all these beautiful pictures. What do you mean, what's your point? But I credit him for really politicizing me. You know, what is the point of my pictures? And this next one is a great example. This is a, at a uh, Tibetan orphanage in Northern India. And I went there several times to document these kids and I took great pictures, but the thing is that I took, I was taking. And what I realized is that, oh, I can, I can just rejig all of this and I can give back. So instead of taking these pictures that I you know, love to take and it's for me and it's very satisfying, in this instance what I did is I came back to Canada and had an exhibit and all the money that uh, made at that event went back to the children's village. And that was great. I realized, okay, I'm, I'm onto something here. And started looking for photo stories through the eyes of empathy. And empathy is to stand in someone else's shoes, to walk a mile in someone's shoes, and to identify with, with someone. And, and once that was my base for doing things, everything changed. And then everything changed further because I started looking at animals. Animals have always been my passion and uh, protecting them and volunteering and walking the dogs next door who weren't being walked and kept in the backyard. So I thought, ah, oh, okay, I can combine my skills as a photographer and my passion for animals. And this is how the We Animals project began. This is one of the earliest images from We Animals. It's kind of hard to tell what's going on. I, I wanted to show things from the perspective of the animal, not always the human, as, as we often show. So this is at a thing called Wolfstock, and they have a stupid dog trick competition. And so what he's doing is putting his dog's entire head in his mouth. And everyone's having a really great time, and it's very funny, haha. But what I did is I crept up on stage and tried to photograph what it might be like for the animal. And, and show a different perspective. One of the tenets of the We Animals project is that animals are someone, not something. Bruce Friedrich, who now works at Farm Sanctuary, is using that a lot. You might see it online, and you might see it applied to many of the images out there and social media right now. And I'm really using it for the We Animals pictures. For stuff like this, shooting images that, you know, a lot of other people took the same image. Her friends took this picture, and here is this young woman, beautiful, having a great time holding an alligator. When you look more at the wee animals' images, you see, hopefully, if I'm doing my job right, a, a different perspective. And what I'm trying to show is not just the event of this woman at a tourist site, but the alligator who has his face taped up and actually who lives in a box all day and is, is an object for our use. And so images like this one, for example, this is, for me, this is trying to show that this is someone, not something. And again, someone, not something. This is a, a dog, a street dog in Chile, and I spent hours nearby to this dog and photographing him, and no one was really noticing him but me. Someone, not something, in bullfights, the bulls are of course objectified and are meant to you know, be a tool to glorify what the matador is doing. So again, trying to show things in a different way, different perspective, something that focuses more on the animals and not the, the situation 
of the humans. I am a investigator for Zoo Check Canada, so I've been to loads and loads of zoos, and again, the goal for that is trying to show the experience of the animal, and quite often when we go to these places, it's for our enjoyment, and it really is about us, and people say, people would argue, and I've had this conversation many times, that zoos promote care for animals, but I would argue that that doesn't actually happen. I don't think that people go to zoos and then come away with a, a sense of wanting to protect animals. I think what it does actually in many cases is objectify the animal and teach us e even from a young age that they're there for our use and they're for our display. Same thing with this picture. It's a pretty wonderful and exciting thing for us as humans to be able to see a hippopotamus like this up close, but what right do we have to keep an animal like this in captivity? We Animals is also about bearing witness. I do, unfortunately, spend a lot of time at factory farms, slaughterhouses, because there's so much behind the products we use and the food that we consume. And if you're eating a piece of bacon, it's not a bacon, it's pig, and it had an entire life. So that's my job, is to, is to show what came before. You'll see a lot of that. So bearing witness to suffering, but bearing witness as well to the happy stories and the stories of sanctuary and rescue. And we really need to, need to focus on these as well because we need to keep our spirits up as activists and people who care and want to make the world a better place. And I can speak firsthand to this. Having suffered from doing all this stuff, we need to not just focus on the bad, but we need to focus on the good and we need to celebrate that. Many of you recognize this woman, Dr. Jane Goodall. She's definitely one of my heroes and a big influence on me. And she said, only if we understand can we care. Only if we care will we help. Back to some of the earlier images from We Animals. I was walking down the street in New York City and she walked by me and no one else noticed. No one else seemed to notice the strangeness of her carrying a, a body who has been taxidermied. And I noticed that no one was noticing. And I thought, okay, well, I have to photograph that and I have to immortalize this so that people do see like new, new things and new ways of seeing animals. And it's not just for the bigger animals. I'm not trying to protect just the cows and the dogs, but the small ones as well. This is a scorpion, and similar to that alligator, this scorpion lives in a tiny box until it's time to come out to entertain the tourists. The mission statement for We Animals. We Animals aims to raise awareness through art and photojournalism that non-human animals are sentient beings with moral significance and deserve to live free from exploitation and suffering in the food, clothing, experimentation, and entertainment industries. In other words, and most importantly, good photos speak a thousand words and can change hearts and minds. There are a lot of images we're all familiar with. They're grainy and they're not very good images and uh, you see them in a lot of campaigns, but we really, really need good images to speak to people and, and that's, that's part of my job. This was photographed at a dairy and veal farm. The challenge for the We Animals project is to document things in such a way that the viewer finds new significance in these ordinary, often unnoticed situations of use, abuse, and sharing of spaces. And a good example of that is the deer head picture that we just looked at. In other words, making us question what is normal, like going to a rodeo and celebrating the abuse that happens there, and trying as much as possible to show situations from the perspective of the non-human animal. And that means getting into the thick of things and getting right up close, showing what it's like to be that animal. And this is at a, at a rabbit and chicken slaughterhouse. I promise you it's going to get better. It's going to get happy really soon. <laughs> also, this was something that was quite overlooked at a zoo. Pelicans. They are pelicans, aren't they? Yes. These pelicans not only live in a dingy cement room, but they didn't even take the time to put the straw out for them. And I just found it so sad that they had these clumps of straw and they all, they all stood on them and they, they just sat there. So again, taking, taking notice of things that we just walked by. And this is a different perspective on a circus elephant. This is behind the scenes. And on the back, on the far, on the far right, you can see some people with their kids and their strollers just hanging out and totally disregarding this, this chained animal. Something else I look at in the We Animals project is our cognitive dissonance, which is defined as inconsistency between one's beliefs and one's actions. And of course, we all see that day to day. A lot of people love their pets, but eat, eat other animals and make justifications for this or have a hard time really looking at the issue and what that means. And I use this picture as a really great example 
When we're young, a lot of us are very compassionate for animals, but we outgrow that and we're taught to outgrow that and we're taught to put aside feelings of empathy for animals. This little boy, he was about six years old and he was training to be a bullfighter, a matador. And as he was training, I asked him, I said, why do you want to be a matador when you grow up? And he said, because I love bulls. Speaking of cognitive dissonance, this is another example. In India, cows are revered and they're holy, and quite often when they're not in service to humans anymore, they say, oh, well, we let them live, but what they actually do is that they put them out on the street where they have to fend for themselves, and they often starve to death and get hit by cars. So, you know, there's, there's stuff to think about that we're not really thinking about. If we can bridge the gap between loving certain animals and using others, we can start to overcome our cognitive dissonance and become more compassionate stewards of the earth. Like this woman here, she rescued this pig when he was just a few days old, and he uh, plays with the other four dogs, and they have a nice family. He comes in the house and everything, and she does not eat pigs. <laughs> Some of you may recognize this place. I was shot at yesterday, actually, at the Kahala Hotel. They have a swim with dolphins situation there. Again, coming back to cognitive dissonance, this is a situation where we really love dolphins. Everyone loves dolphins and wants to be near them. We don't love them enough to actually give them the freedom that they are entitled to. But you can see the, the humans with the dolphins. But what you can also see, which is really heartbreaking to me, is the, the sea in the background, which is just you know a few steps away, but that the, the dolphins will never see. I promise you it's going to get happy soon. <laughs> And again, using animals because we love them, but then putting them in these situations. And this is the loneliest penguin in the world. This is at a shopping mall, actually, in Thailand. I included this image because it's such an image of ob objectification. I'd like to see more discourse about aquariums, not just zoos, because aquariums are actually even worse than zoos. This is an orca who would be naturally sw swimming like thousands and thousands of kilometers, but instead lives alone in this tank and is pointed, out and pointed at and stared at for his entire life. Uh, this is a, becoming an iconic image for the We Animals Project. You may recognize this man. He was a speaker here previously. His name is Gene Bauer, and he's the co-founder of Farm Sanctuary. And he rescued his friend here, O.P. When O.P. was left on a dead pile, he was a veal calf, but he put him in his, in his car and he nursed him back to health for months. O.P. lived at Farm Sanctuary for 16 years. They were very good friends. This is Susie. I love this image because it's such a great story in itself, of the relation, kinds of relationships that we can not have with animals. And I just love this because Farm Sanctuary is one of the only places where turkeys and chickens can actually be safe standing on a stovetop. <laughs> I included this image as well because it shows the kind of le the level of care that we can have, not just for the dogs and the cats and the cows, but even for birds. The lady in the wheelchair is named Rosie, and she can walk with the help of a wheelchair. So they actually went and made her a wheelchair. And then Cinco de Mayo is the bird on the <laughs> in white, and their boyfriend and girlfriend. And he's also disabled. He doesn't have uh, any feet. So he hops and he flies. And when I crouched down to take photos of Rosie, he hopped right over and leaned into her. Like, don't touch my woman. <laughs> what are you doing talking to my woman? <laughs> oh, they both had long lives at Farm Sanctuary. Oh, what, she, she has a neurological disorder. So um, she can use her feet with the help of, a, of uh, the wheelchair. Two more Farm Sanctuary friends, Casey and Zoop. And this is one of my favorite friends, Dino. And he was, he was rescued from the basement of someone's house in New York City. He was fed, he was in his Italian household and he ate mostly carbs. So his bones didn't grow right. He has crooked hips, a crooked jaw, crooked ribs. But he's got a great smile <laughs> because of that <laughs> crooked jaw. He's an old guy now, so he has to wear a jacket. He's very thin, but he's always been the head of the herd. And this is a group of about 150 sheep and goats. And he's always the first to come up to the humans and welcome us. And I just adore him. So part of my job is to put a face to the billions of animals we consume each year, which is a hard thing to do. But the thing with using words like billions and millions, or even hundreds, is that it's hard to empathize. It's hard to really feel for a number like that. We can barely even comprehend it. So with that in mind, 
I follow stories of rescued animals around the globe. Launch into this one. This, her name is Phantasma. She's a three-year-old spent dairy cow. This is the day she was being sent to slaughter. But the sanctuary got her and brought her to the sanctuary. She's on her way there now. She doesn't know it. For all she knows, she's just going to live a life of misery like she has lived. And the thing with cows is that they can live 20 and even 30 years. But she was considered spent after three years. She had major mastitis. She had overgrown hoofs. And she wasn't producing enough milk. So they were going to send her off. Now, we brought her to the vets at Cornell and got her settled in and blood work and some good food and she had a good sleep there that night and the next morning when we showed up again she was eating she was chewing the hay and she saw us the group of us and she started mooing and mooing and mooing and trying to like get through the bars to rub her head against us and i swear she knew you know she knew she was going to a better place and she knew that we were the people who had helped her it was really lovely we all had a good cry over that now this is her now, a phantasma has been shortened to Fanny, and this is her best friend Blitz, and he was the first one to greet her, he was just a, a, a wee calf then, and this is a few months later, and he's much bigger, and these two are inseparable, and now she's an ambassador for all the animals who aren't as lucky as her. This was actually the same day, the same day they rescued Phantasma, they rescued a one day old veal calf named Sunny. And he was sickly, and so he was going to go straight to slaughter. However, Farm Sanctuary got him, and again, brought him to the vet, and he had a full blood transfusion, and he was there for two days. This is him now. He's growing up big and strong. He and Phantasma are going to be featured in a new animal rights documentary that follows me. I'm the central human in this film. It's taking a bit of getting used to, to being in front of the camera instead of behind the camera. I much prefer being behind the camera. But anyway, it uh, follows me as I do investigations around the world, and it tells the story of this film. It's called The Ghosts in Our Machine, and I have some pamphlets over here if you want to take one after. And so you can, you can follow uh, Fanny and Sonny's story in that film, and that film is coming out, hopefully, fingers crossed, Sundance, January. High hopes. <laughs> we'll see. Another great thing about the farm is that for Thanksgiving, they don't eat the turkeys, they feed the turkeys, and they have a whole celebration around that. I really like this image of Grace because it also shows she was a spent animal and she was being sent to slaughter, but they just put a brace on her leg, which was broken, and she's fine. She's been living there for years. Oh, hi. This is Keebler. He's someone, not something. I had to include this picture just because he's so unbearably cute. <laughs> so now we're switching continents. We're going over to Uganda. This was a project I shot for the Jane Goodall Institute, and I mentioned earlier these are poachers. These snares, I did bring one home with me. Now this is just made of bike wire uh, for brakes, and these things are indiscriminate. You walk through one, and it tightens, and it doesn't untighten. And this can kill anything from a chimpanzee to a rat. The forests are set up with thousands and thousands of these. Quite often, the hunters don't even find them again. That's, Very serious. That's a what? This is a snare made of uh, brake wire for bicycles. Great, thanks. You're welcome. So these catch and kill just about everything. It started with a group who decided that this was not a good way of treating the forest and the animals and it was just killing too many animals for no reason because often the, the animals who are trapped in these are never found again. It is jungle. So they started a community project where they would go from community to community and talk about other forms of agriculture and ask the poachers to no longer set these up in the forest. So this is us uh, cutting through jungles with a machete. I had dengue fever at the time, I was so sick. But anyway, that's a whole other story. <laughs> he has a GPS and he's found one of the snares, so he's marking where the snare is and they do it hectare by hectare. It's really systematic, it's really great. And they have removed thousands of these over the years from the forest. So this is one of the chimpanzees in that forest who can get killed, caught and killed or maimed by these things. And I included this image specifically because He's so human-like, and it's good to, for us to have that reminder once in a while that they're so very much like us. And I find that he's, you can tell he's like us because of that bare patch on his arm, and he looks, you know, same muscle structure as us. This is another wild chimpanzee. This is a diker, and a diker is a, like a deer-like, rabbit-like mammal found in this region. It was a pretty sad story. We could hear the diker off in the distance, the calls, and we knew that there must be one caught in one of these snares. 
And so we cut our way through the forest. We were really excited to find this animal so that we could free him or her. Unfortunately, the animal was still alive but had been mostly eaten by pred predatory birds. So we had to actually kill the animal. It was really, really sad. But, you know, there are these stories, but there are also so many animals that are being saved by these guys. And sometimes we do find them when they're in traps and we are able to free them successfully. This is them at about nine in the morning having a break and we'd already been out there for about four hours. These are really, really amazing individuals. This is them at, uh, in one of the communities where they get together and they have a meeting and they talk about other kinds of agriculture and other ways of getting protein to their families. They're getting them to sign this piece of paper to say that they will no longer put these in the forest, but a lot of them uh, can't write, so they put their thumbprint on the paper. That's what's happening there. Uh, this is a sanctuary in Uganda for chimpanzees, and this is a woman, she's in her 80s, and she's gone back to the sanctuary every year to help. And again, it's another example of all the amazing people out there taking small and big steps to, to do things for animals. It's easy to think, well, you know, that's not happening here, that's over there, it's not my problem, it's their problem, but it really is our problem because a lot of the meat trapped for bush meat and that forest meat is often shipped over to big, rich uh, countries like ours and sold, I think, I, what did I write here, $50 million per year industry, which is huge. So it really is our responsibility to know about this stuff and to say no to it and educate others about bush meat as well. The question is, what do we use the bush meat for? It's actually a delicacy here with, with expats, and so you can get people spending even $500 for a piece of chimp steak. I'll get more into that soon. I'd like to introduce you to some of the chimpanzees who I've met, who've been rescued. This is Mandy. She's someone, not something. She's 45 years old in this picture, and she had been kept at a research lab for her entire life. When they're eventually released out to the sanctuary, the way you can tell if they were wild trapped or bred at the facility is if they're afraid of, of going outside at the sanctuary. But anyway, it turns out that she was wild trapped in Africa because the minute she saw the green grass and the shrubs and the trees, she ran out there and she went and sat in the lagoon area with the breeze and the, and the reeds blowing all around her. And this is in that moment where she was tasting freedom for the first time since uh, she'd been shipped over from Africa. This is Pepsi and he has a foot fetish. <laughs> He really does. I met him in Florida at Save the Chimps. He's one of the almost 300 rescued chimps that they have. And he's original because of those beautiful eyes, those golden eyes. When I was introduced to him, he started motioning to my feet and clapping and motioning to my feet. And they said, show him your feet. It's the least you can do. He's been in a cage for 30 years. Show him your feet. So I took my shoes off and showed him my feet. And he was very excited by that. <laughs> This is at that same sanctuary. It was founded by one of my heroes, Dr. Carol Noon. She's a primatologist. And she didn't like her picture being taken, but she did like this image because it was her hand and she's the one on the inside of a cage. And the chimpanzee who's communing with her is out and he has like five or six acres on these beautiful islands. Okay, same continent, different animal. These are gorillas. This is Con Daniel. In this picture, he's a nine-year-old juvenile gorilla, and his parents were killed for the bushmeat trade. And he was brought to this sanctuary, which is called Ape Action Africa. Uh, that was about a week after his birth, so he was just a wee thing. In comes Rachel Hogan. She's the woman in this picture. And she went to this sanctuary 10 years ago to volunteer for three months. And three months became, six months became a year, and she realized this place needs a lot of help. I'm gonna make this my life's work. So she went back to the UK to settle up her things and then moved to Cameroon permanently. And what she promised to these gorillas, she had all these baby gorillas with inadequate care and inadequate places to live. Her promise to them was that she wouldn't stop until they had a proper forest sanctuary home. So my visit to the sanctuary coincided with the fulfillment of this promise. And that's why I call this story Rachel's Promise. So this is the day before they're moving from this very small enclosure. It looks good, but it's actually a very small enclosure. It's very close to town, so they can get sick. They can get diseases from humans. So this is the day before they're moving to this enclosed area. It's hundreds of, of acres. It's really, really great. They treat her like mom. <laughs> she didn't know if they would just 
go off into the forest and never be seen again at this in this area, or if they would, you know, or if she'd get more opportunity to spend time like this with them. So sweet. I like how he's holding her boob, <laughs> like mom, you know. <laughs> and he's much too big to be carried around on her back like that. He's like 150 pounds. <laughs> Uh, this is one of the other caretakers, the gorilla caretaker. His name is Apollinaire. Chimpanzees are very much like us. They love to communicate and fight and talk and, and connect with eye contact, whereas gorillas are very quiet and it takes quite a special person to connect with them. And he was one such person. So this is the morning uh, where they're going to sedate each gorilla do a health check and transport them to the new, the new enclosure. And Rachel was a very worried mama, as you can see on her face. So one by one, they sedate them, do the health check, get their vaccinations. And I just adore this interaction between Apollinaire, and I think this is Pippin. Um, yeah, just such tenderness. Now, what happened here is that uh, she woke up, who, this is Nona, she woke up early from the anesthetic, which could be highly dangerous to me and everyone in the truck, seeing as she'd never been in a moving vehicle before. And I was sitting in the front seat, and when she opened her eyes and sat up, I thought, oh gosh, this could be really big trouble for me. But because she was in the arms of someone she trusted, she actually stayed calm and, and fell back to sleep, and we were able to bring her to the new enclosure without any big problem. So Rachel made sure to be with each and every one of them as they woke up. They were nervous, they'd never been outside of where they had always lived, so she was there rubbing their backs and smiling at them and reassuring them, helping them to look around the new... Okay, so I should clarify this. This is a hundreds of acres of enclosure. It's enclosed by electrical fence so that they're not in a cage, but they do have a caged area where they can come in and eat and, and sleep if they like. So this is where she introduced them for the first 48 hours and they got used to that environment before being let out into the new enclosure. So the day came and she didn't know if they were gonna be afraid and stay inside or if they would go out into the forest. And sure enough, they all ran out and they hugged each other and they jumped up and down and they ran into the forest. And she was so thrilled, she had a good cry. And as she walked away after I took this picture, she threw up her arms and said, okay, God, you can take me now, I'm happy. That story ran in Elle magazine, which is a fashion magazine, and it's one of the ways that I try and get my images out there. As you can imagine, there aren't a lot of big publications who want to run animal rights stories, so sometimes I have to you know, put a, a swing on it. Like, for example, pitch that story as a beautiful young woman who's gone to Africa to save the gorillas, and they really like that, so they ran that story. But, you know, I'll take what I can get, and it's a way of getting the message out there about bushmeat. Uh, so the We Animals photos get used in a humane education program. Uh, I go to schools regularly and talk with kids about compassion and animals and how we treat animals. Uh, I work with lots of campaigns to give them really good images that they can use to forward their message. Magazines and books and exhibits which act as fundraisers for the organizations that I work with. And then I have a, an agency in New York who they love my images but they don't really know what to do with them and they're kind of struggling with getting them published so you know we're working on that but I've I've told them that you know that there are more people who are caring not just about the humans at war but the war on animals and I'm asking them to just keep working at, at getting the images out there on to Asia this is a rescued Asiatic black bear in a hammock at a sanctuary so why do bears need rescuing? This was a cub confiscated at the Lao Chinese border and now safe at a sanctuary. There is an industry called the bear bile, farming industry, and bear bile has been used for centuries or millennia actually in Chinese medicine and it's used as a cure-all from erectile dysfunction to bad breath to cancer. Now I should tell you right up front that the bile is actually totally um, they can reproduce it synthetically perfectly so there actually is no more need to use take it from bears and keep bears in cages so that they can tap their gallbladder but uh, they still do because it's convenient I'll go on a journey now of some bear rescues this is one of the clean bear bile farms that I snuck into 
uh, don't do that at home. <laughs> I'm not advising anyone to sneak into any bear bile farms. <laughs> uh, uh, they can live, you know, 10, 12, 15 years in these cages of this size. This is a bear named Miracle. And when she was a cub, she was put into this cage and the door was closed and she never ever got out of this cage until she was brought here to the sanctuary. And this is during her rescue. She had a lot of, a lot of trauma as anyone would living in a cage that size their whole life. So you can see the calluses on her back end and it's because she would rub her back against the bars all day and she would rub her head against the bars all day. But she doesn't know right now. This is a very stressful, stressful situation for her, but uh, she doesn't know she's about to arrive at her new home. I included this picture. I really love it because it shows the cage that she lived in, but it also shows the backdrop of where she's going to spend the rest of her life. And this is the Animals Asia Foundation, and they have wonderful, wonderful facilities in Vietnam and in China for these bears. So they've sedated her. And I was able to get up close then, and you can see what a mess her paws are and the calluses on her forehead um, because of the rubbing. So they got her out of there and did a health check, and this was just beautiful. It was loving to photo loving and beautiful because they were just so tender with her, and to see them, you know, put cream on her on her cracked ears. They did blood work. They fixed up her teeth. It took about four hours. And you can see the state uh, that their paws are in. Uh, bear paws should not look at all like this, and their long nails. So they trimmed up. They trimmed up her nails. Here's some of the volunteers who, who help out at Animals Asia Foundation, staff as well. And again, you can see that backdrop. You've got the cage on the one side, but you've got that beautiful backdrop where the, where the bears will be allowed to go and, and live. <laughs> and they are much, much happier at the sanctuaries. There's a lot of education happening through the Animals Asia Foundation as well. Uh, it's run by Jill Robinson. She's one of my heroes. And she works tirelessly, tirelessly for these bears. And now they've extended their project to not just focus on bears, but to focus on dogs and cats as well. So here's Miracle on the bottom left. This was a later trip, two, two years, three years later. And that's her, and she eats well, and she has a lot of friends, and she's a funny, funny girl. This is Laika, and apparently it's better to eat a yam with three paws, <laughs> holding on to it with three paws. Uh, I really do have an affinity for bears, so Bear with me while I show you a few more of these. Wah, wah, that was awful. <laughs> this bear is posing for a school picture, apparently. This is Arcte, and he's a, a Malayan sun bear. I just love this picture because he's the picture of perfection with that beautiful coat and those beautiful eyes. It shows how they eat. What they do is they put the food on the top of their paws, and they chew away at it. And then when they're done with the core of the papaya or the nut, they throw it away. It's very sweet. And they have hammocks that they can lie in all day and bamboo they can chew. And they encourage foraging and natural behaviors at these sanctuaries. So they, a few times a day, they go out into the sanctuary, they bring the bears in, they put fresh fruit and vegetables and nuts everywhere and new toys, like even, even basketballs, and they put them out. And then when they're let out again, they know, they know that they're gonna have a great time looking for things. So this is a bear who's just found a piece of lettuce. This is Lama looking very upset because David's running away with his girlfriend or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh, he's so cute. He just looks so sad. He's actually a very happy bear. They just look very sad. Now, this picture is not what you think. This looks like a very, very, very sad picture. And indeed, this sun bear was used for bear bile for four years before he was rescued by Free the Bears. And this is at their Cambodia sanctuary. And some bears like to be out all day. Uh, roaming around with the other bears, but this particular bear wanted to be inside near the people, socializing with the people. About him, he was, he was kind of begging for jam, he likes pineapple jam, and I got a little bit too close to the cage and he actually pulled me in, in towards him, but not in an aggressive way, he was just playing. It was like getting a bear hug. And I told this, this story in an, in an interview recently, and an artist named Cherie Boyd in New York City heard heard the story and she actually illustrated it. Oh, now what I didn't mention is that you can't see that bear's paws, but he has no front paws. They were cut off for a bear, uh, bear paw soup. So just to add to the atrocity of this, when the bears start producing lower quality bile, they cut off their legs for this delicacy. And so here was this bear, so forgiving, wanted to be with humans still, and was playful and 
anyway, this this artist, she's amazing. She she illustrates animal stories all the time, and that's also her way of, of getting messages about animals out there. Part of my work is to do investigations, open rescues, and working undercover. I don't actually do this in the USA because I would be considered a terrorist under the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, and I could be put in jail for a long time. So I do this in lots of countries, but uh, not the USA. And about going to these factory farms, it's pretty grueling stuff for me and, and obviously for the animals. But the point of going to these places, for me, is to put a face to the suffering. When we think about factory farming, these are animals suffering by the millions and billions, hard to understand. But if I can go there and document what it's like, for example, for these chickens to be rounded up for slaughter, you, you get a better sense of, of what it's like for them and what they go through. This is during an investigation. Again, getting close to the individuals, this is one of, one of about 2,000 birds. It's kind of a long story. They all had to be euthanized. It was very sad. And uh, going into places as a tourist, I often do that. Just like with the dolphins yesterday, I just went in as a tourist. Same with the, with the bullfighting, trying to show the individual. I also go to greyhound races, where, as many of you probably know, the animals are, if not adopted out when they become slower, they will be destroyed. There's a big movement, as you know, in the US and other greyhound racing countries like Australia, where people are really becoming aware of the issue with greyhounds and racing, and, and you'll see a lot of them being adopted, which is great. This is a polar bear who is used for uh, entertainment, basically. He's a movie star, and he's in many commercials, but when he's not dated and performing, he lives in this backyard alone. It's gonna get happier soon, I promise. Uh, during another investigation back to zoos. I do look at zoos quite a bit and their conservation efforts and their breeding programs. And this was the third baby, this one mom who just kept, she, they would artificially inseminate her and then she would reject the babies. She just didn't want to be having babies in captivity, but they kept re-impregnating her. And uh, this was the third baby and this baby died a few weeks after the picture was taken image of domination from the leather boots that are above the animal and the stick and the bars. And similar to this one where we have this big manly hand with the ropes and an animal that can obviously not move anywhere. What I mentioned before, there are so many actions behind an end product and we need to know, if we want to be conscious consumers, we need to know where our food is coming from. And this is a veal calf who's about 15 minutes old, who's being removed from the mom so that we can drink milk, cow's milk. The next images are a little bit difficult. Speaking of knowing what's behind something, with uh, animals used in testing, when we think of animals used in research and in testing, we think of that like animals in cages and labs in these sterile environments. There's also before that, where the animals come from. Are they, are they wild trapped? Are they bred in captivity? So I went to Southeast Asia and spent about a month going from, uh, to breeding facilities, photographing what it's like for the animals before they even get to the labs all over the world. I went actually, I, I posed as a, as a buyer. So we went and we pretended that we were buyers for, for the US and Canada. So he was showing us, literally in this picture, he's showing us his product. Not an individual, but an object, a product. This was his product, and we could buy 600 of these if we wanted. And uh, when he took that mom from the cage, the baby clung, clung to the mom, and wow, what a sight. So it kind of gives new meaning to you know, buying, buying products that aren't tested on animals, for me anyway. They live in really terrible conditions. They're terrified of humans. And I included this picture because of this incredible situation. These, these macaques are jammed into cages and they have to share food. They just throw food into the cage and so the alpha males get all the food and they're these robust, healthy animals, whereas the younger animals and the females don't really get to eat and a lot of them starve to death. The smaller macaque that you see is blind and this other macaque never left the blind macaque's side. And that was at great personal risk, of course, because now both of them, he has to fend for both of them, and he's not getting enough to eat. But uh, it, was an incredible, it was incredible to see like that, that empathy, even in such dire situations for these animals. It was beautiful and it was tragic. I also do investigations at fur farms. We'll just show you one picture from that because it's pretty awful stuff. But again, people need to know 
if they're wearing fur, where the fur comes from. And mink are free roaming solitary animals. They spend most of their time near water. However, in farms, they can live in cages this size, up to 10 of them at once. And the stress causes them to cannibalize each other. So you see that they are missing ears and parts of their faces. This is my favorite part because in my work I get to glorify and show people all the heroes around the world uh, who are doing amazing things for animals and uh, working so hard, be it letter writing or be it you know, going out to rescue individuals. So I'm going to show you a whole bunch of pictures of, of all these great people doing great things. Does anyone know this woman? She's quite famous. Her name is Lek. And Lek means small, actually, for in, in Thai. And she rescues elephants. She has a huge sanctuary called the Elephant Nature Park in northern Thailand in Chiang Mai. And she's probably about this high, but she is the biggest personality and the strongest woman that I've ever met. And this is her with one of her rescued elephants. So we have people like her who are doing really big, big things and have a lot of visibility, but there are a lot of people who do great things who don't have recognition and, and, and don't have the visibility the way, the way she's recognized. She gets lots of awards for things, but then there are people like this. Now this is in Toronto recently. We passed a ban on the sale and um, purchase of shark fin products. We're really, really proud of that in Canada. And normal citizens like these guys came to City Hall by the hundreds and hundreds to speak up. And people even wore shark outfits <laughs> and sat there day in and day out waiting for their turn to give their two cents about, about how they felt about, about shark fin products. This is a chicken in a very strange situation. She, she's a layer hen and she was rescued from a factory farm and she's in transit to the sanctuary where right now she's at the vet clinic. <laughs> so she has no idea what's going on. Maybe she's terrified. She definitely wanted to get out of the situation. I, it's just such a quirky picture and she's got a great hairdo, so I <laughs> included that. So she's on her way to a better home. And this is one of her companions at the sanctuary. So this is the first time that they're putting their little feet down on grass and drinking water normally and walking around and enjoying the sun and sunbathing and choosing where they want to go and who they want to be with. It was really spectacular to see them, you know, act out their natural behaviors. Uh, this woman is Susan Morris and she started by rescuing one pig one day not knowing that this would turn into a big sanctuary that she now runs in Canada and this is Ashley and she rescued him as a two day old calf. I think she bought him for about five dollars. He was sickly. They were going to slaughter him but then she said can I have him and so they charged her. They charged her a few bucks for him. It's really hard to see what individual is in the arms of this man. Uh, it's actually a poodle. This is a male poodle, about eight years old, and he was a breeder at a puppy mill. And this is, again, his, his first taste of freedom. There was an investigation by the SPCA, and they went in, and this, is, this man holding this poodle with such beautiful tender hands is one of the volunteers. Again, a regular guy who gets no recognition, but you know he steps up whenever they need volunteers to help with these things. Uh, I absolutely adore this image because of the tenderness. And that dog actually had a great haircut, got all his teeth pulled, he had a very infected mouth, and he was fostered, and he has a home, and he has a great life now. I adore this image as well because of the trust. She adopted him. And then there's the funny situation. She's a cruelty investigator, and they get some really difficult situations that they have to deal with, but sometimes they get a phone call with someone saying, help, help, the dog's out on the ledge. <laughs> Can't get the dog back in. <laughs> So they're eyeballing each other and not really knowing what to do with each other. And this was quite beautiful. I went down to the site of the Hurricane Katrina disaster back in 2007 and there were a lot of people there doing dog and cat rescues and he was just a regular guy who came and his job was to clean the pens every day and he did that for months. And this was the moment See, he had been looking at this dog and developing a relationship with his dog and this is the very moment where he sat down and the dog crawled up onto his lap and he started petting the dog and he said, okay, I'm going to take you home. And he, he did adopt this guy. She is a wonderful Tibetan nun up in northern India and if you've been to India you know that the dogs are really sickly there, the street dogs, they don't really have a good situation there. However, in this town, 
all the dogs are really fit and healthy and relaxed and friendly, so I thought, I'm going to investigate this. Why, why is it this town that's different? And at about 5 p.m. every night, they all the dogs start going up the hill, so I followed them. And I followed them to this woman's place, and with broken English and a lot of gesticulation, I figured out that she uses every penny that she has to feed these dogs and spay and neuter and vaccinate them. And at night they sleep up here and then they go down into the you know town during the day. But anyway, it's amazing what one person can do for so many animals. I met this dog in India and she was so crippled that she actually walked that way, the way her legs are crossed. She pulled herself forward this way and she really, really broke my heart. And this is another example of giving back when you can, when, when you have a skill, there's always ways of, of, of giving back to help animals. I was pretty devastated by the dog situation in India, so I had an exhibit of the India photos and donated the money to uh, the organization. The woman that you see there is Dr. Devi. She runs the Animal India Trust, and it was enough money for them to buy a new medical van for dogs to go out and pick them up and spay and neuter them. She's over 80 years old and she's protesting the use of Botox. I love it. I absolutely love it. She's so beautiful and she's still out there uh, protesting every weekend and I just love her beautiful wrinkled face and that she's protesting the use of, you know, testing on animals for these beauty products. This is in Atlanta um, at Yerkes where they still use chimpanzees. I think the U.S. is the only country who still uses chimpanzees for, uh, for research and they're is a chimp named Wenka, and they refuse to retire her to a sanctuary. So these people go out all the time, and this day was Wenka's birthday. I believe it was her 56th birthday. And so they actually went out and protested and, and said, you know, it's her birthday, she's 56, it's time to free her. This is also in the UK. This is the Hunt Sabotage Group. Even though it's illegal to hunt foxes, they still do it, and there's, I can get into that, but long story short, they still do it. So there are people, um, and, the, and the cops just let it happen, so there's all sorts of groups across the UK called hunt saboteurs, and they actually go and they distract the dogs, and they use whistles, and they, they spray to cover up the scents of foxes. So I went and photographed these very hardworking activists that day, just running, running, running all over the place, and it was exhausting, but no foxes were actually killed on that day. I also spent uh, three months with Sea Shepherd in the Antarctic. So they're a direct, direct action group. They go down there and they intervene with the whaling. And the year that we were there, I think we saved over 500 whales from slaughter. I was the scaredy cat on the boat. <laughs> Everyone was so brave and everyone wanted my job because as a photographer I had to be everywhere. I had to be in the thick of things. <laughs> I had to be in the small boats chasing after the big whaling vessels which terrified me. And people were jealous of my job but I wish I could have handed off the camera. Yeah, <laughs> awkward. <laughs> so about what we can do. I love showing about what people are doing around the world and talking about that. My skill is to take pictures but we all have skills that we can use to, to help animals. Mainly we can lead by example and live compassionately. We can speak up about cruelty when we see it. We can eat a veggie and vegan diet, appropriate here because this is the veg, veg gathering. And again, use your skills whatever they may be, whether it's letter writing or volunteering or donating, whatever you can. Of course, don't support industries that promote the exploitation of animals like circuses and rodeos. And of course, another easy thing to do is to adopt animals rather than uh, buy them. And you can foster and spay and neuter your animals as well, just like Bob Barker says. And it's also really important to celebrate. It, it can be very difficult being a, compassion, a compassionate person in this very violent world. And I'm sure a lot of you feel that way and you can feel overwhelmed with, with how bad things get. But it's really good to look after ourselves and to celebrate. I love his shirt. It says animals matter. And we can eat. We can actually eat our way you know, to a better planet as far as I'm concerned by eating veggie and vegan food. We can march, we can adopt, we can volunteer. This is in Florida, turtle rescues. We can protest, we can build compassionate communities. We can make art. We can laugh together when dogs eat an entire head of celery. <laughs> That's a true picture, <laughs> that really happened. <laughs> And we can revel in and with community. Very, very important, like we're doing tonight, actually. So the best way to avoid being overwhelmed by a problem is to become part of the solution. 
So I have one last story. This picture doesn't look like much. It's out in the desert. This is Alamogordo, New Mexico. You don't see anything except for blue sky and desert. I introduced you to Ron at the beginning of this talk. He used to live in that spot. And he spent many years in a cage being used for research. And I went to this spot where there are no longer animals being used. And I was walking, one of the buildings has been completely torn down, but there's just a slab of cement there. And so I went and walked around on it, and there's debris left over from, from where that facility was. But I loved that there were cracks in that cement, and there were leaves and, and flowers growing up through the cracks. And as I looked around and saw some of the debris, I actually found this. This is a piece of plastic that must have been used on some of the machinery in there. And strangely, it says oxygen on it. So I keep this with me all the time. And when I get overwhelmed, I think of that place that no longer exists. And you know, Ron was there, and now he's not. He went to a better life. And it reminds me to breathe. It reminds me that things are changing. Thanks for having me. Oh, repeat the question. So what, um, what drew me towards becoming vegetarian and eventually vegan? Well, I was always very compassionate and caring for animals. Uh, like I said, when I was a kid, there was a, there was a dog barking in the neighbor's yard, and he lived in the backyard. And he was a huge dog, and I was a wee little girl. But I would go and play with the dog and walk the dog, and the dog would just yank me down the street. And I was always aware of the unfairness between, you know, with, with the way we treat animals. That turned into me giving up meat when my mom had 10 chickens as companion animals. They laid eggs, but they were allowed to roam free in the yard, and they became my friends. And I learned that they had personalities just like dogs and cats. But then there was that transition where I was really having a great friendship with these chickens who would sit on my shoulder and come in the house, but then I would have chicken at night. And I realized, oh, this is a big problem. And uh, I didn't have much infrastructure. Some people have a lot of, of veg community already or veg friends, but I didn't. And I thought it would be a really, really big deal to, to give up meat. But it was great. And then I thought, veganism, well, that's very, very extreme. I'll never do that. But I did an internship at Farm Sanctuary where you have to be vegan on the premises in order to be there. So I thought, OK, well, out of respect for the animals, I'll, I'll be vegan for the month, but then I'll go back to being veggie. But on day one, so April 1st, 2003, that was my first day of living a vegan lifestyle. And the freedom that I felt, the way my heart felt, it felt right, you know, and I wasn't abusing any animals. So I was vegan from that point on. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne MacArthur, for your extraordinary and moving photos of animals and for your words of compassion. We really enjoyed your talk, and I hope that some of us are moved to action as well. Mahalo to all of you for coming, and have a safe return home. Good night. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344 or visit our website at www.vsh.org, vsh.org.